I'd like to welcome you. Uh, my name is Rogelio Sainz. I'm the Dean of the College of Public Policy. And I, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the uh, Dean's Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, this, the intent of this particular lecture series is to bring individuals who are researchers, policy makers, as well as practitioners that are key individuals that are addressing major policy issues. And certainly immigration is, uh, is, uh, represents one of these issues. We've had a couple of um, uh, uh, town hall forums. We had one back in the spring with the uh, San Antonio Express News. And then more recently in September, uh, Congressman Doggett was here uh, uh, as part of a, um, of a town hall meeting. Uh, we've also had seen a lot of debate taking place. And if we read the newspaper today, there was a uh, kind of a suggestion that uh, it looks uh, difficult for immigration reform and, and the vote to, to take place during 2013, so that debate continues to, to take place. Uh, Jeff Passell, who is our, uh, our distinguished speaker this evening, is certainly one of these individuals who was in, in the forefront, not necessarily in terms of the, in the engagement and the creation of policy itself, but he represents the major individual who is providing the data uh, to policymakers and also informing the debate about what is going on with, uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, immigration. And a lot of our knowledge uh, regarding trends that we see, ch significant changes that we've seen over the, the last uh, several years uh, has come from the work of uh, Jeff Cassell, who's been doing this work for, for a long period of time and is, represents the, the key go-to uh, person in, in, uh, with respect to immigration data. And now what I want to do is uh, introduce uh, Joachim Singelman, who is the uh, chair of the Department of uh, Demography, who will introduce our, uh, our speaker. Yeah. Well, let me join in uh, welcoming uh, Jeff Marcel uh, to, to this evening. Jeff and I, we go back um, a long time, uh, about 40 years. Uh, we shared in the, uh, an office. Uh, we were both graduate students. We're not that old. We were risk kids. We graduated <laughs> uh, from high school very, very young. And uh, anyway, so um, anyway, we shared this office, and uh, almost every every lunch, uh, Jeff had a friend over, and they were practicing bidding uh, in in bridge. And uh, he was very uh, proficient in bridge. Uh, I don't know that much about it, uh, but uh, he was of the equivalent of a, a chess master, grand chess master in, in, in bridge, uh, however you choose to get master plans. So the only thing that I remember from it was uh, what I learned was uh, there's an opening when you, when you start bidding, and you, there's one opening, it's, it's one, and he can correct me. Uh, it's, it's called one, one club. And that means that you have absolutely diddly nothing. And you tell your partner that you know, whatever you have, you know, uh, if you want to go for something, it's, it's all in your hand uh, because you don't have anything. So that's how I feel today when I introduce uh, Jeff. Uh, I would say uh, one club. I don't have anything compared to what, I, uh, what, uh, what he brings to the table here. Uh, Jeff is just incredibly accomplished. Uh, uh, as I said, somewhere else, you know, when you see a story on, on immigration, uh, it's either produced, you know, the data about which the story is written are produced by him, or he is asked to comment on, on someone else's work. There is just no story about uh, of data immigration, uh, document, undocumented work, where his name doesn't appear in the nation news, newspapers. Um, um, our dean already talked about the wide range of what he what he has done. Uh, Jeff uh, um, uh, was at the you know he's now at the Pew Foundation. Previously, he was the at the Urban Institute for uh, for, for a good number of years, uh, and previously so previous to that, he started his career after finishing his PhD at Johns Hopkins at the Census Bureau, where again he did a variety of things. Um, if you look at uh, sort of where he shows up, he's on virtually all major panels. He's <coughs> the, uh, he's on, has served on the committees of the Population Association of America. He has been on several panels of the National Academy of Sciences. And it goes on and on. Um, he's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. 
And in 2004, American Demographic magazine selected him as a, dia uh, as a demographic diamond, one of the five most important demographic social scientists uh, in, in the last 25 years whose work you know, got cited and, and referred to the most. So we are absolutely in for a treat today. And I, I thank you very much for being here and welcome you to the It's worth pointing out that uh, American demographics did do that, and then they promptly went out of business. So I, I don't know what to make of all of that. Um, uh, I am at the Pew Research Center, uh, formerly at the Pew Hispanic Center, and now the Pew Research Center's Hispanic Trends Project. And just a couple of words about what we do, because it, it does color some of the things I talk about. <clears throat> the Pew Research Center is part of what the Pew Charitable Trust calls the three-legged stool of public policy. They support uh, policy research, they support policy advocacy, but they, they think that it's important to have data and facts to base those other things on. So the Pew Research Center's mission is to provide facts that are relevant to policy uh, advocacy and policy research. But we do not take positions on policies, and we don't take government funding, and we don't uh, do policy research. So if I say something that's about policy, it's a slip. I'm not supposed to be talking about policy. Um, so. Uh, it's, it's great. I, I'm, I was raised in Texas, uh, but in, not in the good part of Texas like San Antonio. I was raised in Dallas. Uh, but it's nice to, it, it is nice to be back, and San Antonio is one of my favorite places, so I'm glad to be here. Um, what I'm going to try to do is, is do a little bit of a kind of primer on immigration and, and talk a little about history to talk about how we got to where we are today because I think it colors a lot of the attitudes and uh, debates that we're having now. Uh, and then talk some about uh, some of the changes and, and some of the uh, uh, new trends that have emerged. Um, there's, uh, I call some of this myth and reality. There's, there's a lot of concern about immigration, that we're immigration's at an all-time high. And in some ways that's true, and in some ways it's not. And I'll talk a little bit more about that now, uh, later. We have, we have more immigrants than we've ever had before, but then we have more people than we've ever had before. Uh, the idea that the U.S. welcomes immigrants is, is part of the kind of myth it, it, it's it's our, our view of ourselves as a country of immigrants. Uh, <clears throat> I would say that historically the, the best description of, of the U.S. attitudes towards immigrants is exactly what we have today. That the immigrants we're getting today, people say, they're not so good. They're not like the immigrants we got before. Those were the good immigrants. Of course, you can go back a hundred years and you can find articles being written uh, then that say the same thing about the immigrants today that we consider the good immigrants, the Southern Europeans, the Eastern Europeans. Back then they weren't, weren't exactly welcomed. It was the immigrants before them that were the good ones. Of course, you go back 50 years before that and, and people hated the Irish immigrants, which by 1900 were the good immigrants. So uh, this, this is, there's a long history of this. Uh, ben Franklin is, is, is thought to have been concerned that there were too many Germans coming to Pennsylvania. It was changing the character of, of the state. So uh, it's something that's uh, been, been there for a long time. Uh, the idea that immigrants in the past uh, assimilated or adapted and became Americans is, again, I think a misreading of history. It took generations. Uh, in most cases for, for the immigrants and their children and grandchildren to become uh, uh, accepted as part of the country. And 
we're very much going through that today. Uh, and a lot of today's immigrants are doing, following the paths that immigrants historically have. It's, it's really not that different. Uh, but what has happened is that within a fairly short period of time, uh, since 1970, the country has undergone a major set of changes, and the country is quite different today in terms of its makeup vis-a-vis -vis immigration than in 1970. Certainly, 1950 was very different, and even 1990 was quite different. So uh, I'll talk some about that. I'm going to talk about how many immigrants we get, where they're from, what the trends are, where they're going. Uh, a little bit about the policies. There's more in the handout that I'm going to talk about here in terms of just what the laws have been. Um, and I, I hope to spend some time talking about what the immigrants today are like. And the big, one of the big takeaways for me out of this is that the unauthorized immigrants to a very great and underappreciated degree are uh, families and families with children, as opposed to the stereotype of a single male. Uh, that's sort of the message that will come through uh, a lot. And talk about some of the factors that are driving immigration. We've had a lot of very big changes within a, just really the last five or six years. Uh, unauthorized immigration has basically stopped. Uh, you never know that from the attention it gets in the press and the politics. Uh, but uh, after a long period of very rapid growth in the unauthorized population, that turned around and the number, the number of unauthorized immigrants living here actually decreased for a couple of years. Uh, since about 2005, there have been there's been a balance in, in terms of how many Mexicans are coming to the U.S. versus people going back to Mexico. And uh, after about 2008, there were more Mexicans going back than coming to the U.S. Again, you might not know that if you read the newspapers and listen uh, to the, the political debates about this. What we don't know is if this is a real change or just a lull, uh, whether it's temporary or whether it's something that's going to continue. Uh, Overall, uh, the total foreign-born population, uh, it didn't reverse, but the growth basically stopped. Uh, and that's due mainly to the fact that there's not nearly as many, hardly any EU unauthorized immigrants coming to the country. Legal immigration has not been affected in, to the same degree. Uh, legal immigration has, has continued. Uh, the numbers haven't changed very much, but there's some new trends if you look at the overall picture. Uh, again, something you'll notice that uh, with the drop in uh, Latino immigration from unauthorized immigrants, we're actually getting more immigrants from Asia now than from Latin America. And, and that hadn't happened for a very long time. Um, about half of all the unauthorized immigrants, adults, are parents. Most of those kids are U.S. citizens, so we're really talking about families with U.S. citizens when we think about the unauthorized population. And the other big factor over about a 15-year period was that the immigrants went into new areas in, in very rapidly, very <coughs> rapid growth in places that in some cases had never seen an immigrant and in other cases hadn't seen an immigrant for 100 years. Uh, that pretty much stopped in 2007 to this dispersal. So uh, 2007 is sort of a key date in all of this. Uh, a little bit of history. Uh, talking about migration flows, that is people coming into the US, uh, we had seen very large increases uh, starting after World War II. Uh, the increases have stopped, the numbers have been relatively stable, but along with this is a shift in where the immigrants come from. Uh, we now are getting uh, about 75 to 80% of our immigrants come from either Latin America 
or Asia. Historically, before this period, 80 to 90 percent of the immigrants came from uh, Europe and Canada. And that, those, those areas no longer send many immigrants. Uh, beginning around the 1980s, uh, we were get, started to get more unauthorized immigrants than legal immigrants. Uh, and that was part of what was behind the shift to Latin America. Uh, that is no longer the case, so we, we went through a period of 20 years where that was true, and now it isn't. So, uh, again, big changes recently. Uh, the flows, especially the unauthorized <coughs> flow, tends to be very sensitive to economic conditions in the U.S., uh, but also in the sending countries. So immigrants do look to some extent at what their opportunities are where they live versus what their opportunities are here. Uh, and that's true especially of unauthorized immigrants. Uh, and a lot of the new destinations that emerged emerged because of unauthorized Mexican immigration talk a little more about that later. Uh, this is, uh, and the, the numbers, the, the numbers aren't that important here, it's really the relative numbers. These represent decade by decade uh, immigrant arrivals to the U.S. in millions, and the data go back to the 1820s, and so you can see this is in the 19th century, the numbers went up and down. This is the Civil War. People didn't come as much in the Civil War. Uh, this is uh, uh, opening up uh, in the 1880s, a big economic growth period, and a period of some turmoil in, in Northern Europe. Uh, the 1890s were a period with four, uh, what they called panics at that time. There were recessions or depressions. There were four of them during that decade. And when there weren't jobs here, people didn't come. So, we saw a big drop in immigration in the 1890s and then a big boom in the next 10 years. Almost 9 million immigrants came in the first decade of the 20th century. And between 1905 and 1914, immigration averaged more than a million a year. Uh, basically, it averaged then what we're getting now. Um, but uh, World War I came along. People couldn't get out of Europe. And then in the, in the 1920s, we passed uh, several different pieces of legislation to restrict the inflow of immigrants. Uh, and immigrants were viewed very negatively throughout this period. Uh, the first thing was we put numerical restrictions on for the first time. Up until, up until uh, the 1920s, basically, we had open immigration. People came, they were admitted if they were healthy, and, and they were in. Uh, the other thing was that uh, we put in geographic quotas in the 1920s, and the quotas were designed based on the origins of the population as of 1890, and it was chosen for a very specific reason, and that was to keep the undesirable immigrants from southern Europe uh, and Eastern Europe, the undesirable immigrants like my poor grandfather, uh, from coming to the U.S. And it worked. You, you couldn't get into the country if you were from Italy or Poland or, uh, or, or Russia. Uh, and so the numbers went down. Um, the Depression hit, nobody came. No jobs, 25% unemployment. Uh, we got. Uh, we get more immigrants in about five months now than we got in the entire decade of the 1930s. So half a million immigrants. More people left than came. Uh, not all of them by choice, uh, but more people left than came. This is war. This is basically World War II when nobody could get out of Europe and nobody was coming to the U.S. Uh, after that, things started to pick up. Uh, but you see some shift in origins. We start getting the, the dark bar. The bottom bar is Europe and Canada, and the top is the rest of the world. So we started to get uh, uh, more from specifically Latin America. And the numbers gradually increase. Uh, 
Uh, some legislative changes brought even more. And so we've got this steady increase in the number of legal immigrants arriving. <coughs> On top of that, we have unauthorized immigrants coming. And uh, there's a little bit back here, but it really starts in the 1970s, 80s, uh, 90s. And you can see we got as many legal immigrants, illegal immigrants, as legal immigrants in that decade. Um, and big, big numbers. It, it, was, it wasn't until the, uh, till the 1980s that we surpassed the numbers from uh, 1900s. Uh, the numbers, legal immigration is still high, and, and with unauthorized, we're still, we're a little below, the, the last decade was a little below the 1990s, but not much, so still very high levels. Now, as I said, we're getting more immigrants numerically than we got in our past. Uh, this, this looks at the immigrants who come during a decade as a, as a share of the immigrants, as a share of the population. This is per 1,000. So uh, basically in, in, uh, here in the 1850s, we got 12 immigrants for every 1,000 people that were in the country. Uh, and you can see the high levels are back here in the 19th century. Uh, we're we're uh, not close to the peak levels before, and, and it dropped a little. And basically, if you look at the average of these rates across all of these decades, you get about 5.2. So immigration in the last decade was basically average in terms of the U.S. population. So if we're talking about relative to our size, we're, we're kind of at a normal level, if you will. Uh, if you're talking about numbers, we, we're getting more than we've ever gotten. Um, why, do, why do we admit immigrants? So this is, what is the basis for our immigration policy? The economics of immigration tend to drive the discussion that it makes us competitive, we want to admit the best and the brightest, uh, and uh, it helps the country to admit uh, immigrants to create jobs. Um, but if we look at what share they make up of legal immigrants, the people admitted solely because of their skills and, and qualifications, it's only about one in seven or 14 percent. Um, the next big thing people talk about is family unification. We admit people because they're parts of families that are here in the U.S. This is really what drives our immigration policy right now. Two-thirds of illegal immigrants are admitted because they're close relatives. Usually, almost all of these are spouses or children of people who are already in the country. So the best way to get into the U.S. is, is, is to, to be married to somebody who's already here. Uh, we admit uh, refugees because they're, they're fleeing uh, uh, difficult situations of various kinds. That's about one out of seven. Uh, we, the 1990 Act introduced the idea of diversity in the migration stream. Part of the reason that uh, the politicians decided to do this was they wanted to get more Europeans to come. Uh, and then, there was a set aside for Irish immigrants that Senator Kennedy carved out in this. Of course, the Europeans don't want to come here. They've got mostly a good situation back at home. Ironically, this diversity uh, led to more Asians and Africans being admitted. I don't think that's what the people who set it up had in mind. Uh, but it's a small share. It's about 50,000 a year. Uh, this is uh, this this is one of the things that's being discussed to cut from to, as a trade-off in, in the legislation because it's it's really a lottery. Uh, and then part of the reason the main reason for discussing this is that part of the reason uh, for having an immigration policy so we can decide who comes and, and, and keep us secure. Uh, and there's not much within the emissions that deals with that specifically. But the idea there is to keep people out rather than let people in. So that's all the flows. That's the people coming in. 
this is the what demographers call the stock. This is the number of immigrants who are actually living in the country at a point in time. Um, and you can see that the Historically, the peak level here was in 1930, after that long period of very large flows of people coming in. Uh, and then as we, as we restricted the flows, the numbers started to drop, because the only way you can become part of the foreign-born population is to immigrate. The, these people have children, but their children are, are part of the native population, because they're born here. And so with, with the reduced inflows in the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the numbers started to drop. We got down to about uh, less than 10 million in 1970. Um, that changed, changed a lot. <laughs> the numbers started almost straight up here. Uh, where by 2007, there were more than four times as many immigrants. <coughs> This is an era here that a lot of people look at as sort of the golden age and the idea one that's what they grew up with. Um, and in fact, uh, in fact, it's atypical. Uh, the other thing, of course, is these 9.6 million immigrants were largely white, European, and old. Uh, the median age of the foreign born then was, was over 60. The median age of the foreign born population today is about 40, and it's largely Latino and Asian. So it's, it's, it's very different in a number of ways. Uh, after 2007, the numbers kind of leveled off. Uh, we didn't get as many new people coming in, so the, the growth stopped and, and isn't much higher now. Uh, the other way to look at this is what share of the immigrants what share they represented the population. And the peak levels were back here in the 19th century, varied around 13 to 15 percent. 1970 was the lowest on record, lowest for which we have data. And we're, we're back up to about 13 percent, but it's not as high as it had been here. And again, if you, if you listen to the people who want to restrict immigration, they talk a lot about the 50s and 60s and think of that as, as somehow a normal time. And if you look at this chart, the normal time is, is here, not here. So in, in many ways, what we're going through is, is, is normal for the US. Uh, where do they come from? Mexico, uh, Mexico, uh, other Latin America, and Asia represent uh, about three quarters of all the immigrants living in the country. This is both legal and unauthorized. Uh, the European share has been dropping steadily. We're not getting a lot of immigrants from Europe, and, and the ones we have are, are dying off. Uh, so we're going to talk, focus a little on the unauthorized population. Uh, this, these are various kinds of estimates that are around. Uh, uh, the numbers steadily increased here from the late 80s to 2007, uh, growing very rapidly. Um, that's that's um, about 500,000 a year growth. And it means that more than 500,000 had to come for some leave all the time. So we were getting, on average, about 700,000 or more new unauthorized immigrants every year. Uh, this drop, by the way, isn't because we control unauthorized immigration. We controlled it by legalizing people. This was the, the uh, legalization programs passed in 86 led to a drop in, in the population. Um, well, that changed. Uh, uh, 2000, after growing by half a million a year for, for about 20 years, we, we saw the numbers drop by half a million a year uh, after 2007. Uh, and um, this means that more people were leaving than were coming. Uh, the number coming dropped a lot, but a lot of people left for those two years. Um, and I'm going to switch scales here so we can talk a little about this. What's happened since 
is that the numbers have basically stabilized. We, the, this light band around it's a margin of error. And it looks like the number has gone up, but given that the, the data source has a very big margin of error, so we weren't comfortable uh, saying the number went up. Say it may have gone up, but certainly it's, we're confident that the number isn't going down. Uh, these 11.7 million immigrants are about 28% of all the immigrants living here. Uh, the big share is naturalized citizens, uh, people who have came as immigrants and have become U.S. citizens. Uh, this, uh, on this chart, the only number that's growing is naturalized citizens. We get new legal permanent residents coming every year, but a lot of them become naturalized citizens. So new people come in here, but people move from this category to this one. So this one's been fairly stable for about 10 years. Mexico is by far the largest source of the unauthorized immigrants. About 6 million unauthorized Mexicans, a little over half. Uh, uh, it, and it's truly an order of magnitude different. The next largest country is, in these estimates usually comes out to be El Salvador in the four to 500,000 range. So it's Mexico and then other countries. Uh, the rest of Latin America is, is about a quarter of the total. So uh, three quarters are, are Latin American. Uh, Asians here are a large group, but, but not the way they are at the total. Uh, and, and there's no single country that really dominates uh, any of these. Uh, we get a lot from El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, but we're also getting a fair number from China and India. And any country that sends us a lot of immigrants, there's some, some spillover. Uh, the Mexico numbers also peaked in 2007. And uh, much of the drop by, by, 2000, uh, by 2009 and 10 was a drop in Mexicans living in the country. Uh, and this number, unlike the total, this number continued to go down. Uh, and um, it's, it's not going, again, it's not going up. It may be going down. We'll have a better reading on 2012 when we get some new data. In the next month or so. Uh, interestingly, the, the non Mexicans, uh, those numbers peaked also in 2007 and dropped by 2009, but we've seen some increases since 2009. Uh, and again, with the vagaries of statistics, we can say that 2012 is higher than 2009, but we can't say it's higher than 2007. But it does appear to be going up uh, in the case of the non-Mexicans. Uh, this I won't talk much about. It's in the handout. This is legal immigrants and where they're coming from. Uh, Mexico is sort of a, a constant share in here at, at uh, 11 to, to 16 percent. That's Mexico. Uh, the big shift uh, in origins is, occurs right here in the 70s. This is Asia. And we didn't, we didn't let many Asians in in the 50s, and we didn't get many in the 60s, but we changed the law. Two things happened. We changed the law to put all the countries on an equal footing in 65. And in the 70s, we started admitting uh, Vietnamese refugees and Southeast Asian refugees. So uh, a lot of change here. Uh, we're getting more immigrants from Asia in, in each of the last two decades. Uh, three decades, actually, then we got total immigrants in the 50s. So, big change there. Mexico is also our largest source of legal immigrants. About 20% of all the legal immigrants are from Mexico. Uh, again, a quarter from the rest of Latin America, and almost a third uh, from uh, Asia. So, we're up here again. Three quarters of the legal immigrants living in the country are, are from the same three regions. 
I'm going to talk a, a bit in detail about Mexico. Um, I'm going to try to go through this really quickly uh, because I'm going to run out of time. Uh, we had a rapid buildup of Mexicans in the 70s. People think we've always had immigrants from Mexico, and it's true. But, uh, but until 1980, Mexico wasn't our principal source of immigrants. Uh, and uh, the, the flows into the U.S. peaked in about 2000. Uh, and I'll show you a chart that looks at total flows from Mexico to the U.S. And, and in my opinion, it's driven almost completely by employment opportunities in the U.S. Uh, and we've had a big shift. About 80% of the Mexicans coming to the U.S. now are coming as legal immigrants. Ten years ago, about 80 to 85 percent were coming as unauthorized immigrants. So that's that's flipped as the numbers have changed. Um, this is the number of Mexican immigrants living in the country. Uh, uh, we deported, forced out a lot of Mexicans in the 30s. That's the only time until recently we saw the numbers go down. This is 1970. There were about three quarters of a million Mexican immigrants living in the country which isn't a lot if you think about what we've done now. Uh, there were more uh, Italians, more Germans, more British, and I think more Canadians than Mexicans. Uh, I'm going to change the scale here because what happened after 1970 is uh, the numbers tripled in the next decade. Uh, it kept going up uh, by uh, 1996, we had 10 times as many as we had in 1970, uh, but it didn't stop. It kept going up until it hit about 12.8 million uh, in 2007. Now, just a little piece of information. The country that has the most immigrants besides the U.S. is Russia. Some of it's an artifact of the breakup of the Soviet Union, but there are 12 million immigrants in Russia. So the number two country in terms of the number of immigrants has fewer immigrants than we have Mexican immigrants. Um, that, uh, and they represented at that point about a third of all the immigrants living in the U.S. Uh, but the numbers started to go down as the flows dropped off uh, with return flows to Mexico. Uh, now, the other piece of this is, is a lot of the Mexican population is living in the U.S. If we combine Mexicans in the U.S. with Mexico, uh, we hit a peak in 2007 of about 10 percent of all the Mexicans in the world living in the U.S. And that's not the U.S.-born children, and that's not the Mexican-American population. It's people born in Mexico. Um, this is estimates of how many Mexicans came each year, uh, and this is both legal and unauthorized. It peaked at about three quarters of a million per year, uh, with uh, well over 600,000 of this being unauthorized uh, immigrants. But then uh, with the recession, and even a little before the recession, the numbers started to drop. So uh, our most recent data is that the inflow was only about 20% of what it was at its peak. And this is, uh, this is almost all legal immigrants uh, at this point. Um, this is the employment rate. This is the opposite of the unemployment rate. Uh, and uh, these things move very, move very close together. So, I like to think of unauthorized immigration as discretionary. You know, unauthorized immigrants can decide to come or not. If there's not a job, they're probably going to come. Uh, legal immigration is, is more of a, a, a queue and a waiting list, and people tend to come when, when they get their, when their turn comes, whether, whether the U.S. economy is good or bad. So, what we see here is largely a response to the U.S. economy, in my opinion. Um, how do they get here? Well, a lot of them sneak across the border. Uh, we've increased enforcement. Uh, this is the, the 
the probability that a Mexican setting out for the U.S. would get caught trying to sneak in. Uh, uh, and you can see the latest data I have is from a, a, a decade ago, basically, but the, the probability that they would get caught has gone up significantly over the last 30 years here. Um, but interestingly, uh, almost everybody eventually gets in. So they may get caught, but they, they tend to keep trying. And almost everybody who decides to come to the U.S. gets in. Uh, the big drop is due to the fact that people are deciding not to come. And so there are places in Mexico where historically large numbers of people have come to the U.S. and, and now hardly anybody's uh, looking to come. Um, the big thing here, though, is that the apprehensions at the border, uh, the, the people who snuck in across the border only represent a little over half of all the unauthorized immigrants in the country. So this focus on border enforcement is not dealing with the entire unauthorized population. About 40% came to the U.S. legally with uh, a visa of one sort or another and then stayed. Uh, and increasingly, we're seeing people coming through the ports of entry at the border with documents that, that let them come in and then they decide to stay. Uh, this one may be going down, but uh, we don't have good data on it. And, and this is just to show you legal immigration. So. Well, what, what happened though, so we've had this long period of Mexicans coming to the U.S. in large numbers and the population growing, but what happened here? Uh, this is uh, this is data from uh, this is data from uh, the U.S. This is U.S. I'm sorry. This is data from the Mexican Census where they asked people where'd you live five years ago. So in the 2000 Census, 670,000 people said they lived in the U.S five years before the Mexican census. Uh, that number more than doubled uh, by the 2010 census. 1.4 million people said they were in Mexico in 2010 and in the U.S. in 2005. Uh, this is the flow the other way. These are the numbers from the chart I put up before. Uh, between 95 and 2000, about 2.9 million Mexicans moved to the U.S. Uh, by 2005 to 10, about 1.4 million. So if you put this together, we, we've hit zero here. So between 2005 and 10, the net flow between the U.S. and Mexico was roughly in balance. Again, not something you hear a lot about. Uh, this seemed to happen in between 2006 and 2009, we don't know exactly when, and uh, these are sort of annual numbers we've tried to put together. Uh, this is the Mexico to U.S. flow, this is the U.S. to Mexico flow, and so the last couple of years here, we're in 2010, there were a lot more Mexicans going back to Mexico than coming to the U.S. Um, and who are they? an interesting thing that, that some colleagues of mine have focused on. Uh, most of them, 60% uh, were people who had been living in the U.S. Uh, five years before the 2010 census. So they had lived in the U.S. They were in the U.S. five years before and at some point they decided to come back. So I call them long-term uh, Mexican migrants. Um, there's a group of short-term shorter term people who were in Mexico in 2005 came to the U.S. before 2010 and then went back to Mexico. So these are more short term migrants, uh, about 200,000. This is an interesting group. These are U.S. born children of Mexican migrants. Uh, there's about 300,000 of them. It's a growing number in Mexico. It's creating some interesting public policy uh, difficulties and options in Mexico. These people are almost all entitled to Mexican citizenship, but they don't all have it, so they have to do some registration. Uh, some of them are in schools. Their Spanish may not be very good. 
So they're having some language difficulties in, in some of these places with the, with the children. Um, so it's, it's a kind of interesting flip of, of some of the things. What, what these people are not is they're not U.S. retirees moving to Mexico, uh, which is something you hear about, but this other adults, even about half of them appear to be people born in the U.S. to Mexican immigrants. They're just over 18. So uh, it's, it's, it's largely families of Mexicans going back to Mexico. Um, this is the this is the just a little factoid to throw in. This is what share of the new arrivals are from uh, Latin America, and this is what share are from Asia. And you can see this crossover here. So we're getting more new immigrants now from Asia than from all of Latin America. Um, okay, who are the unauthorized immigrants? Um, they're here to work, largely. This is labor force participation of, of men. Uh, Ninety-two percent of the unauthorized uh, uh, immigrants in the U.S. men are in the labor force, uh, compared with eighty percent of the natives, age eighteen to sixty-four. And this is necessity. That's why they're coming, uh, and, and the data support that notion. The native-born men, a lot of them are in school. Uh, some of them are on disability, and some of them are retired. The unauthorized immigrants really can't do any of those things, so they're, they're working. Uh, in the case of women, the, 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 the role is reversed. The unauthorized women are a bit less likely to be in the workforce than native women. And, and this is largely due to the fact that uh, these are younger women, a lot of them are staying home with young kids. And in fact, that the difference in the share of staying home with kids more, more than accounts for this difference in labor force rate. Uh, this is, this is a, a, something that surprised me when I found it out. Um, this looks at households uh, and, and classifies them as is this a household with a couple and children, minor children of theirs? Uh, only 20% of native-born households fit that, that model of the, the nuclear family. Now, a lot of these are households that used to have young children, but the children are moved, and, and uh, a lot of these are seniors living by themselves. Uh, but if we look at the unauthorized population, 44% are families, 44% of the households are families with young children. So uh, it's very much a family situation and something that when I, when I looked at this quite surprised me. Uh, the unauthorized population is increasingly settled in the country. Uh, almost 60% have been in the U.S. 10 or more years now. Uh, in 2000, it was only about a third. So a big shift, largely due to the fact that there aren't many new people coming, and the ones that are here are staying. Um, a majority of the unauthorized adult women are married, uh, and this is married, uh, or with, and the bottom part is with children. These are single women here by themselves, uh, a, a small minority. Uh, even among the men, uh, and this is again surprising to a lot of people, uh, the solo male, the, the guy who's here by himself, may have a family back in Mexico or somewhere else, is less than half of all the men. Mostly the men are in couples, and uh, a very large share of them have children, minor children. Uh, again, not, not the picture you get of, of the unauthorized population. Um, what about these children? Uh, well, most of the children, 80, 80 plus percent, are U.S. born. And the U.S. born, the, the number of unauthorized immigrant children has been dropping steadily. And partly that's because the only way 
you can have unauthorized immigrant children is that unauthorized immigrant adults bring their children with them, and we're not getting as many immigrants as we used to get, so we're not getting as many children. And the ones that are here as unauthorized immigrant children become adults when they get 18 in, in my day. Uh, but the U.S. born children have more than doubled from, from 2.1 million in 2000 to 4.6 million, uh, which leads to a situation where uh, very large shares of the unauthorized population are in families with children. Uh, and, uh, and there's uh, the 11 plus million unauthorized immigrants, if we look at their households, their families, there's an extra five and a half million people. So if we think about uh, the, the families that we're talking about, it's not 11 million people, it's over 16 million people uh, that are affected by, by uh, and it's mostly, it's mostly uh, U.S. citizen children that, that we're talking about. Uh, where do they live? Uh, and i uh, do this uh, very quickly. Uh, there's a concentration in half a dozen states. Uh, no surprises. California, New York, Texas, uh, Florida, New Jersey, Illinois. These have been the top six states for immigrants since 1970. Uh, as, of 19, as of 2012, they have a, a bit less than two-thirds of the overall foreign-born population. Uh, that's a big change. In 1990, they had 73% of the foreign-born population. And if, if we go back another 10 years, they had 80% of the foreign-born population. So uh, what's happening? Uh, if we look at uh, popular growth, percent growth of the foreign-born population. The top 10 states in percentage growth, some of these are from small bases in 1990, uh, in the southeast, uh, Georgia and North Carolina are, are big ones. Nebraska, which uh, is largely people moving here to do new packing, interestingly. Utah and Nevada. Uh, the next fastest growing states are, uh, again, spread out across the middle of the country, and, and almost every state in the southeast uh, shows up here, and most of the Midwest and, and the Mountain West. So what we've seen is, is a lot of the growth is occurring out in these areas. Uh, this is the unauthorized, this is the way, one way to look at it, this is what share of the unauthorized immigrants live in California. We went from 42% uh, in uh, 1990 to 23% in, in uh, 2007. Uh, and part of it's immigrants moving away, unauthorized immigrants moving away from California, but the numbers are still growing. It's just uh, not as many going to California. Well, where are they going? Uh, they're not going in large numbers to any of these traditional states. The shares stayed pretty level for most of these states, went up a little bit. It's the rest of the country. Uh, the numbers went from 20% outside these six states to almost 40%. And more importantly, we went from 700,000 to almost seven times as many. Uh, and this is when the debate about what to do about unauthorized immigrants becomes national. It is, it is in, in this period right in here. And seven times as many unauthorized immigrants in, in these states as there used to be. And in some states it's even uh, larger sure. Now that's, that's largely stopped, that spread was largely stopped, and the number hasn't changed very much, but again, uh, the, 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 the run-up here fueled the debate and there's been nothing to kind of stop the debate even though the, the trends have stopped. Uh, this, is, this is what share of the immigrants in a state are unauthorized and the very darkest is, is a third to a half 
And in my sense is in a lot of places there's a tendency to equate the immigration issue with or immigrants with unauthorized immigrants. And in a lot of places there's some basis for that in the data. So in places in the southeast, almost half of the immigrants in these states are unauthorized immigrants. And most of the unauthorized immigrants, even in places like Georgia and North Carolina, are Mexican unauthorized immigrants who, who fueled this dispersal. So this is a case where, where the data give you an insight into why something might be happening instead of, instead of a misperception. Um, just to end up here, uh, what are the immigrants doing? Well, there's there's about eight point there's about eight million unauthorized immigrants in our workforce. They represent a little bit over five percent. It's not a big share, but it's not small either. And, and eight million is not a small number. Uh, in some places, um, notably California, Texas, Nevada, and New Jersey. We're, we're talking about 9 or 10 percent of the workforce is unauthorized immigrants. Um, and my sense is that it's not as big an issue in California as it is nationally. I'm not sure about Texas, but I don't think it's a big issue in New Jersey. Some of the places where unauthorized immigration is a very big issue, Oklahoma, Alabama, Pennsylvania, where they passed restrictive laws in, in various communities. Um, those places, the unauthorized immigrants are, are way below average presence in the workforce. So the, the reality of the presence of unauthorized immigrants and, and the reaction to it can be a bit disconnected. Uh, schools is another place where, where there's a lot of focus on children of unauthorized immigrants. Uh, they represent here about uh, 1 in 15 of, of K-12 students, but most of these are U.S. citizen children. Less than 2% of the school children are unauthorized immigrants themselves. And, and only another 5% are children of unauthorized immigrants. Uh, that, again, varies quite a bit. In, in these, half, these five states here, the numbers are pretty big in terms of share of students who are un children of unauthorized immigrants. 13% uh, in Texas, uh, as high as 18% in, uh, in Arizona, and 15% in California. And again, in, in a lot of these places in the southeast, the shares are, are not very high, but, but it's, it's a political issue there. So we've, we've had a big shift in, in the nature of unauthorized immigration. We haven't had very much shift in the nature of legal immigration. We continue to get a lot of immigrants. Um, what, what, what are we likely to see? And my answer is, the short answer is I have no idea. Uh, and and the, the sub Sub answer to that is I have to figure something out. I'm supposed to do some population projections for my job next year, and the big, the big unknown in those population projections is what is immigration going to be in the future, and I haven't figured that out yet. So I don't know. Um, when when I do them, you'll see what I think. I, now, I, and I will say the last time I did population projections, I was quite wrong. I did them in about 2005, and, and in the write-up, I argued very strongly that we've seen a kind of steady but slow increase in the levels of immigration, growing about the same rate as the population, about 1% a year over the last 30 years, and the, there's every reason to think that will continue, and so my population projections uh, show steady increases in immigration after 2010. That wasn't, that was wrong, <laughs> is what it was. So uh, I'm not sure uh, what this means. Uh, the inflows are way down. Uh, it seems to be a response to the economy. Uh, there's uh, a tendency on the part of 
the administration and this one and the previous one to say they're doing a better job of enforcing the laws and enforcing the border and that's that's cutting down on the flows. I have to say I don't know whether that's true or not. It hasn't really been tested in the sense that the economy, the state of the economy seems to me to be what's driven down the flows. Now we put a lot of effort into enforcement. I think at the point where I'm assuming the economy is going to turn around at some point completely and it started clearly. And we may then have to, that may test the, our enforcement capacity. Uh, interior laws that have been passed by states and localities are designed to make life risky and unpleasant for unauthorized immigrants. Doesn't seem to have driven a lot of people away. Some people left, uh, a lot of people left between 2007 and 2009. Uh, but uh, since then, we haven't seen very large outflows that are matching the inflows. So, you know, that, 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 uh, yes, life is risky and unpleasant, but it's not driving people away yet. Uh, there's some changes going on in Mexico that I didn't talk much about. Uh, Mexican fertility is a fascinating topic. In, in 1970, the uh, fertility rate in Mexico was close to seven children per woman, as recently as 1970. By 2000, that had dropped to about 2.4 children per woman, and it's gone down a little bit since. It's only a little higher in Mexico than in the U.S., and Mexicans in the U.S. have higher fertility than Mexico. Mexican Americans in the U.S. have slightly higher fertility than Mexico. So Mexico's fertility is very low uh, for Mexico. It took a long time for that to have a big impact on how many births there were, but in the mid-90s, they started having fewer births every year. Not just lower fertility rates, but fewer births. Those folks are entering the workforce now so they're not getting the same kind of growing demographic pressure to create jobs. And uh, they're, they're still not creating enough jobs, but, but the demographic pressure is lessened. The factor that, I'm, uh, that I, I think is an interesting one, and I hope there are people looking into this, as researchers, is that we're going through a fairly long period here where Mexicans aren't coming to the United States. This migration to the U.S. Is, is in some parts of Mexico really, in a sense, built into the culture. It's what young men especially do when they reach maturity is they go to the U.S. Um, they don't always stay here, but they go to the U.S. And uh, a lot of the migration is driven by network connections of families in Mexico with families in the U.S. Well, what happens if you go through uh, 5, 10, 15 years where flows have dropped completely? Does that change the culture in Mexico? Does it break the networks? It may well mean that, you know, in, in a lot of parts of Mexico, my sense is the first, the first place people look when they, when they think they have to leave home to go earn a living is to the U.S. Maybe the first place they'll look now is the big city nearby or Mexico City. Whether that's a real change or not, I think is something that, uh, that we'll have to observe as we go forward. And like I said, I think people are, are looking into it. Uh, the key features of, of the unauthorized population as it intersects with what, what to do about it, uh, and, and uh, this isn't the policy prescription, this is some issues that arise out of the data. First is that we're not talking about individuals by and large, we're talking about families mm -hmm. and, and how the, our immigration policies affect families. There are some former colleagues of mine who are looking at what's happening to children when their parents are, are deported. Uh, so, you know, this is this is a, an area that is under discussed in my opinion and, and is under under emphasized in thinking about policies around specifically unauthorized immigration. Um, 
a lot of the flows are driven by networks, connections between sending areas and receiving areas. Uh, a lot of the flows into the new areas were, you know, a pioneer migrant went to some town in Indiana in, in the late 1980s and, you know, his cousins came and then their friends came and pretty soon you have these flows from specific places in Mexico to specific places in the U.S. Um, and as I talked about, the culture in a lot of places is, is uh, uh, re-emphasizes these. Uh, how is that going to work going forward? We don't know. And the big thing here is, and this is, this is clearly discussed, is that we're talking about a lot of people. We're talking about more than 11 million unauthorized immigrants, uh, 16, maybe 17 million people in their families. That's, that's a large number of people who might be affected. Uh, it also means if there's a program to legalize people, it's a lot of work. Uh, it was, it, it in many ways overwhelmed the old INS back in the 80s when they legalized uh, 2.6 million people processed about three million applications. We're talking about four times that many people. Uh, so it's a lot of people. In the 1980s, it was you know, large concentrations in half a dozen states, and even within those states. Yes, Illinois is there, but it wasn't Illinois, it was Chicago. Yes, Florida is there, but it wasn't Florida, it was Miami. Uh, now, with the dispersal, there are large numbers spread out around the country, so the logistics of what to do about this are going to be very difficult, should anything ever pass, but it's part of, part of uh, what goes into it. So, with that, I thank you, and um, some of the new, and I haven't looked carefully at it, it's an interesting question, uh, the, the growth rates may have slowed more in the new destinations because so much of that growth was, was fueled by unauthorized immigration and, and that's the group that's not coming anymore. So the legal immigrants are still coming and they, they, they may be going a bit more to the traditional areas, but even they, they've spread out. Yeah, I was wondering if you have any data about um, unauthorized immigrants who are also in the queue to become legal immigrants. I know when you look at the State Department's feasible to see dates, they went to the Philippines and Mexico. Yeah, um, reference going back to I, the I, I don't. Uh, there's, there's a group, there's some, it's more lore than data, but, but there's, there's, um, of this 11, 12 million that we're talking about, there are a couple of fairly big groups uh, that are not going to be deported, let's put it that way. Uh, one is that there are people with temporary protective status, which allows them to stay in the country temporarily, and that's put that in place, because they keep renewing a lot of these places. Uh, and, and that's uh, been the case for Central Americans and some Africans. Uh, and then there's people who are, have applied for various uh, legal statuses and are waiting. And they're not technically, they're not likely to be deported under any circumstances either. 
Uh, and and the thought is that they're as much as maybe 10% of, of this unauthorized population, but there's a good deal of uncertainty. And um, <clears throat> the way I make these estimates, I basically compare an estimate of how many people are in the country legally with, with both temporary and permanent uh, admission to the foreign born total numbers from the surveys. Uh, and most of the, the, the few other people who are doing estimates are doing variations of this. And I think we've all concluded that if we knew that number, we'd probably put them into the legal population rather than than the unauthorized, the number you're asking about. But it, it's my guess is it's not millions, it's hundreds of thousands, but it's, it's not small. Yeah? The Asian migration, um, with how would you characterize and compare them economically to uh, migration from Latin America and Mexico? Are they more educated? Oh, there is. Yeah, no, the Asian immigrants uh, uh, tend to be very highly educated. Most, most of the Asian immigrants, the, the, the Chinese, the Indians. Uh, the uh, authorized migration? Uh, yes, yeah. Uh, the, in the case of Mexico, in the case of Mexico, you know, we were, we were in a period where 80% were, unauthor were unauthorized. That changed a lot. Uh, but in the case of the uh, in the case of the Asian countries, it's, it's, it tends to be on the order of ten or fifteen percent of the total numbers, uh, and uh, to a very great extent, uh, from what we can tell, there are people who are overstaying legal visas, so they're coming. A lot of them are coming on work visas and, and just staying. Uh, some of them are coming on tourist visas and just staying. But it, it's largely, uh, and again, from what we can tell, we don't have great data on it, but it, it's, it's the overall Asian migration is, is very highly educated. Uh, they have the highest incomes. Uh, of any Asian Indians have the highest income of uh, any group, and they're, they're largely uh, immigrants, not native born. very, very high percentage, not only have college degrees, but have advanced degrees. Uh, and and this, the, the kind of spillover into the unauthorized population is people that have similar characteristics. They're maybe not as highly educated, but they tend to be educated. So yeah, I mean, there are, the, the, if when we looked at, I didn't talk about the education distribution of the unauthorized population, but there are people with bachelors and higher degrees in, in the unauthorized population. How big of an impact do you think uh, the insecurity in Mexico has had in the number of undocumented uh, immigrants from, from Mexico? And uh, I'm assuming that many of the unauthorized uh, Central Americans are crossing through Mexico. So if they're their numbers are increasing a little. I would assume from the numbers that the level of uh, insecurity in Mexico has not deterred them. But do you think it has had an impact in Mexicans on um, I, I, it, it's you know it's hard to separate out uh, these factors because at this point they're kind of all pushing in the same direction. I'm not a good enough econometrician to figure out how to separate it. But uh, but I think. Uh, you know, you look at Mexico, and uh, it's clearly gotten more difficult to get in. Uh, we have data from the Mexican Migration Project on what it costs to hire a smuggler, and those, those costs have gone up. Uh, and the people have to navigate the violence in northern Mexico, and I think that you, you couple that, you couple all of that with the prospects of not being able to find a job and pay back this cost, you know, it's not surprising uh, that people aren't coming, but I think it's only one of, of a number of factors in the case of Mexico. Uh, the Central Americans, the, the situation there seems to be a bit more difficult and desperate these days. And, and the other thing is the Mexican economy's been doing a little bit better the last couple of years. 
but the Central American uh, economies haven't been. And um, I, I guess it's not enough. You know, when people get desperate, they come. Um, the, the, I, I didn't show this here, but in the last year, the number of apprehensions at the border, <coughs> southern border of Central Americans have doubled between 2011 and 12. I mean, it went from 50,000 to 100,000. It's not a huge number, but it's still, it's not a small number either. And, and that does suggest, to some degree, that more people are coming. And, uh, and Mexico has some new immigration laws, and, and the Mexican laws offer some protections for transit migrants now that, that they didn't uh, before, I guess. This the law passed about a year and a half ago. Um, and, and one of your colleagues here was instrumental, Rene Zendinho was, was, was uh, instrumental in getting that law passed in Mexico. And he knows a lot more about it than I do, so you should ask him. <laughs> there was a question by Harry, and then a question in the back. Do you see increasing patterns of higher education in the Mexican migrants? Um, it's still not high levels of education, but it's, it's increasing. I mean, education levels in Mexico have been increasing, and that's reflected in the migrants who come. And the migrants, the migrants who come are, I believe, on average, slightly better educated than the average Mexican. But again, the differences aren't great, and by U.S. standards, the education levels are still quite low. But they're a bit higher than they were, say, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, no, I was just going to ask a little bit about if your projections, do you ever look at um, other economies, particularly like the global south, and the economies are increasingly getting better, and we're seeing it have an impact, obviously, on, on migration. But at the same time, um, do you take that into consideration? Um, th there's um, the short answer is not really and not enough. Uh, if you look at uh, immigration projections, and, and the Center for Strategic and International Studies did kind of a review of methodology, potential methodologies, and, and things, uh, almost nobody really looks at those factors. Partly because um, talking about a huge, a huge uh, effort to get a single number that may not be very, very different. And you not only have to look, if you're going to do that sort of thing, you not only have to look at migration to the US, you have to look at alternative destinations. And you've got to look at a matrix of country by country flows. Um, there's been a little bit of recent work that's, that's focusing more on, and, and, well, let me back up. Traditionally what the U.S. has done, people in the U.S., people in the Census Bureau, is they've really done extrapolations. And they're extrapolations based almost entirely on U.S. data. Uh, and, and that's not very satisfying intellectually. Recently, the Census Bureau's projections looked at the rate at which people are moving to the U.S. from various regions of the world. So they're looking at historic data on how many people came from Europe versus the population of Europe, and how many people came from different regions compared to the population in those regions, and based their projections on those sorts of rates. But there wasn't a lot of kind of economic or econometric modeling underneath that. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's difficult to do, and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do that. I'm going to try and think about it. But. And, and the other piece of this is that, in, as I, I, I think I said it last night, there's really no shortage of potential migrants in the world uh, to come to the U.S. The real question is, Will they be able to get here? Because there, there are 
a lot of regions that I think people would like to come to the U.S., but it's hard, it's hard to get here from China. It's hard to get here from Africa. But a lot of people would like to come. And the question is, is there going to be a mechanism for them to come? No, because I just, I see the trends around Central Americans coming in, particularly a lot higher, but also because I, Mexico also has had a lot of harsh anti-immigrant um, legislation that's passed to set up there too, and obviously the Central American economy is only doing as well as the Mexican economy, and yeah. even though they're still making the track to try yeah. to get here. But uh, there's still, there's not a lot of Central Americans that are still in I mean, the flows... They're not insignificant, but they, the, those countries aren't very big. Okay, we've got one more question if anyone wants to ask, and then we need to close. Uh, uh, do you find a, a significance in European um, uprising or, or like the uh, uh, European immigrants coming over, or have they kind of plateaued and now we're seeing it from Central and South America? Oh, yeah, no, it, we get very few new immigrants from Europe, and a lot of the, a lot of the migration that, a, a lot of the, the, the turmoil and the migrants that might come to the U.S. often end up going to other places in Europe, because it's, it's easier to do, and in some cases, it's not even migration. If, it, if it's one of the countries that's part of the European Union, they can just move, they don't have to. They don't have to migrate, per se. But no, we're not getting a lot from, say, the, the caucuses or places like that. It's more than we used to, but not a huge number. So. And um, on the handout is my email, my phone numbers. Uh, if you have questions or want data, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, as I said at the very beginning, the, the mission of the Pew Research Center is to provide data and information. So answering questions and answering emails is, is my job. So if, if I can help you with any of that, please feel free to contact me. So, and thank you very much. I'm